Well, hello everyone. My name is Paul Henderson. I'm the administrative pastor at Capstone Church here in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm also the host of this podcast called Fringes of the Faith. And if you're watching or listening, you've tuned in to season three, which is a brand new season. And on this podcast, we cover some pretty controversial topics. We don't shy away from them. But I would just like to say as a disclaimer that some of the views and the opinions expressed by our special guests on this program do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Capstone Church or its leadership. But I will say that we do hold to one opinion that's the most important to us. It's the opinion of the Bible. So whatever the Bible says is what we believe. And so with that, we thank you for watching. Hope to hear from you soon. God bless you. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fringes of the Faith. This is season three. Um, we're so happy that you've joined us, and you can tell by the name of this podcast that it's not really your typical faith-based discussion. We've discussed everything from UFOs in the Bible to ghosts to the Nephilim Code. And so if you're brand new to this podcast, we encourage you to go back and check out seasons one and two. Uh, there's something for everyone there, especially if you're into kind of the weird and fringy stuff uh, of the world. So... My name is Paul Henderson. I'm an administrative pastor here at Capstone Church in Fort Worth, Texas. And sitting next to me is a very special guest for Season 3, Episode 1. This is Dr. John Savell. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Paul. Yeah. So uh, for those of you that may not know Dr. Savell, um, he holds a Ph.D. in clinical psychology. He has a specialization of working with children and families with over four decades, that's 40 years, four decades of experience in the mental health profession. I'm wow. old. I'm just, you know, the song Ancient of Days, it was <laughs> written about me. So. Uh, now, you've worked in all facets of mental health, yes, uh, I have. including psychiatric hospitals and outpatient clinics, prisons. Yes, I've worked in prisons. Okay. Neuropsychological rehabilitation centers. That's a mouthful, by yes. the way. And you've worked both in the public and the private sector. Sounds right? like I can't keep a job. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about your current job. You are a full professor at Southwestern Assemblies of God University, or uh -huh. SAGU, and you're also the chair of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Community Services, yes, right? Yes, I am. We have four disciplines, criminal justice, psychology, counseling, and social work. All right, criminal justice, right up my alley. Mm. So, welcome to the Table of Fringe, and today's topic, now, you know we don't shy away from the controversial here. No. Or no, not at all. So, what we're going to talk about today is the LGBTQ plus revolution, or as Dr. Savelle, you would say, transformation, right? The cultural yeah, transformation. Yeah, the transformation that our culture has undergone over the last 50 years, and, Okay, uh, and the impact from this uh, group of individuals, group of people. So, we're going to be talking about... Same-sex attraction, homosexuality, mm -hmm. transgenderism, gender fluidity, and all the other alities and isms and idities that are out there now, and some are yet to come. Yes, some, yeah, we're in the midst of cultural transformation, revolution, however you want to look at it. And uh, what I, you know, want to talk about today is where it began and and, and where we are in that uh, that transformation that is taking place in our culture, and also just to give you an idea of what's to come. Uh, and basically, there are three ways that uh, I want to address. Right. Well, let's so. dig right into it. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit, I guess, about the history. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of our culture, our culture, there are a lot of assumptions that our culture makes about homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, pedophilia, uh, mm -hmm. these different... Um, areas and uh, at the root of all of these is is the underlying belief that people are born that way hmm. i mean i i, I read a, uh, a response by dear abby a number of years ago there was a couple who um, they had a gay couple um, two men move in next door to them in their community and they were concerned about their lifestyle and how its impact on the culture and dear abby's response was that uh, this is not a lifestyle, that they were born this way, and that they can't change their orientation any more than they could 
as man and wife that uh, you could change your heterosexual orientation and it's assumptions that our community has uh, our, our culture has made uh, the, the one problem with it is that it's not based in science uh, science does not support the position that uh, gays and lesbians transgendered individuals or pedophilias are born that way so what you're saying is if we follow the science which is what we've been told to do for you know the I don't know the last two years with this pandemic. Yes. But if we follow the science, there is nothing that that supports there being some kind of a genetic connection um, or gene or gay gene or anything like that mm -hmm. to say that someone is born with a proclivity toward same sex attraction or homosexuality. Now, there's a difference there. there there's no gay gene. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, uh, even though Time Magazine a number of years ago had it on their cover, there's no gay gene. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't have time to go into the specific scientific study that that came from, but I've gone through that, and and it, there's not a gay gene. Okay. However, there is a difference because people can be born with uh, same sex attraction. They mm -hmm. can. There are different things. Uh, combination of genetics, combination of family influences, environmental biology, and, and, in which people can have that attraction. And, and, and here's probably the best way to understand it. We are all broken individuals. Mm. If I have two glasses that are identical and I drop them on a concrete floor, they will shatter in different ways. I'm broken in one way, you're broken in a different way. Somebody who is gay or, or lesbian, they're broken in a different way. We all have areas that we are broken, and, we, and there are things that through our own families that we grew up with that we kind of accepted. We've had struggles in different areas. Um, those are the proclivities that, mm -hmm. that, that may influence. Okay. And, and so, I mean, because there are people who the only attraction they've ever known was from uh, somebody of the same sex, mm -hmm. or they, they've only known the desire to be that of uh, somebody uh, of an opposite sex. But that does not mean that they were born that way. There, may, there are many other factors. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other you know, uh, influences within the womb. There are other influences within family uh, that end up uh, influencing an individual a particular direction. Okay, but but there's nothing in the science that says. In fact, let me if, uh, let me you know, uh, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm going to give you the lead right off the bat. Uh, the American Psychological Association is one of the most uh, supportive uh, groups uh, of this belief that you know we're born that way. In fact, up until 2008, that was their official position that they were born that way. Finally, enough people put pressure on them, say, okay, show us the science. Mm. What does science actually say? And you can go on their website, and I'm going to read you a statement from their website okay. that's there today, that's been there since 2008. And they had to back off from this, their position that science shows mm -hmm. definitively that uh, people are born that way. And here's what they said. Although much research has examined the possible genetic hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles. Most people experience little or no sense of choice about their sexual orientation. So that statement right there clearly was a move by the American Psychological Association to back off their hardline position that people are born that way, that, that they haven't discovered it yet. There are many influence, many factors that end up in, impacting sexual orientation. So um, are these all conservatives? or? Oh, no. The, <laughs> the American Psychological Association, uh, the national headquarters, uh, Probably over half are gay or lesbian themselves, hmm. and and every single one of them support uh, gay or lesbian positions, mm -hmm. and, and and very supportive. They they view it that way. Now that's not been the way it's been historically. Mm -hmm. Historically, um, uh, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. In fact, in DSM one, DSM two, and when I use the term DS 
you know, that means Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, this is the manual that all mental health professionals use to make diagnosis. And okay. they, you know, when they send in, they treat somebody and they send in the insurance, they have to have that code from the DSM. Mm -hmm. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals, one and two, uh, all listed homosexuality as a mental illness. Really? And there were probably several thousand that have been published in prior to, I'd say, 1975 that showed uh, uh, the, the, in research studies that were done and published in uh, professional journals that are peer-reviewed showed homosexuality as a mental illness, and it also showed that when you did uh, a meta-analysis on all of them, that over 50% of these studies showed that homosexuality was something that could be reversed, that people could move from homosexuality in, in to heterosexuality, that it could be changed. Hmm. And, and so that was the position up until we get to about the uh, early 70s, and that's when things started changing with well, the American Psychological well, Association. Well, let's talk, about, let's talk about that change, because I think that's very interesting that at one point, that, that homosexuality and lesbianism, and I would assume, I, I don't want to make assumptions, but I would assume transgenderism yes. might be in that category. And pedophilia. And pedophilia. Now, what, yeah. is, what exactly is pedophilia for those Pedophilia is uh, attraction of an adult to a child okay. and sexual relations between an adult and, and a minor. Okay. Yeah. All right. So how did, how did this change come about, especially if there's no scientific basis um, for you know, a genetic connection, um, and they have agreed with that position. They had to back off of that position mm -hmm. in the psychological community, but yet we have this this kind of this era of acceptance and tolerance and, and now even celebratory celebration. So how, what happened? Yeah. Before I get into that, let me let me just talk about what the assumptions are. So okay. make sure we're all talking on the same okay, that's good. Uh, same things. First of all, as a matter of biology, uh, our culture believes that homosexuality is genetically determined, that it is innate, something we're born with, that we have no choice over. Uh, as a matter of psychology, they see it as irreversible, you, just like you can't change the color of your skin. Hmm. Okay. As a matter of sociology, they consider it to be normal. Uh, you know, it's like other, you know, categories like race, that's normal, sex, that's normal. Again, something that you're born with. From a biblical view, as a matter of biology, homosexuality is not genetic. It is not innate. It's not something that we are born with. It is a matter of choice. Now, I say that word choice uh, with some uh, caution because... Uh, uh, you know, when I put it out that it's a matter of choice, people automatically say, well, shoot, they just need to choose to do something else. Well, it's not that simple. I mean, stop and think about your sin, Paul. Mm -hmm. I, I know you're not perfect. I know you continue to sin. Don't tell my yeah, wife. Don't tell your wife. <laughs> she already knows. <laughs> she it. does. Yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. Choice, when we're talking about it, that, that involves free will. And choice is to say, well, just choose a different life, it's not that easy because, again, it gets back to us, the fact we're broken. Mm -hmm. If it was that simple, I mean, for those Christians who say, yeah, they should just choose differently, think about this. Why don't you choose to not sin anymore? Ooh. Okay, you know, why do you choose to continue uh, you know, acting the way you do that's against what God wants? You know, you choose to change, okay, and to do it. The fact of the matter is, uh, we're again, we're all broken and, and, and that we need the work of the Holy Spirit in us to begin to change us. And let me, let me elaborate a little bit further. In terms of choice, one of the discussions I have with my students, uh, particularly in my upper level and graduate courses, is on the matter of free will. And mm -hmm. one of the questions I ask them is, do you believe in free will? And almost everybody says yes. And one of the things I ask them then is, to what extent do you believe that we have free will? Do you believe we have 100% free will? We have a partial free will, or very little free will. What, where, where do you fall in that? And a lot of them will say, well, we have 100% free will. We can freely choose everything. And my response to that is, let's look at the Bible then. If I have 100% free will, then I would not need Jesus Christ to set me free because the word says I am bound in my transgressions and sin. Mm. And if I'm bound 
and I have 100% free will, I don't need the work that Christ did on the cross to change me. And we all know that we do. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we don't have free will? No, we do have free will, but it's it's within some boundaries. Over in, I believe it's Joshua 24, 15, it says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Mm -hmm. I believe the extent of our free will is the ability to choose whom we will serve. That doesn't mean my behavior is going to follow. Right. It doesn't mean that I'm automatically then going to be able to get rid of all the things that I don't want in my life. But as I choose whom I will serve, and I, and I choice if that is Jesus, then the work of the Holy Spirit is what begins to set my behavior free. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about choice in this area, I'm not talking about that a person who is homosexual or has same-sex attraction can just choose not to have it anymore. No, they may have that the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. But they can choose whom they will serve. They can choose the worldview through which they will view that homosexuality. And if that choice is Jesus Christ, then that allows for the work of the Holy Spirit to begin to change those same-sex attractions, mm -hmm. to begin to change those behaviors that follow. And that's an important distinction that needs to be made when we're talking about that there's a choice involved. It's not just I can choose to stop the behavior, but I can choose whom I will serve and allow the Holy Spirit to change me. That's that's really good. And, and you know, we talk about that a lot, especially in ministry about, um, you know, you're going to serve someone. Yes. You're going to serve something or someone. So it's not a it matter like of a song. It does. <laughs> yeah. Is it Dylan? I don't know. You got to serve somebody. Did he, did he take his stuff off of Spotify yet? I don't know. Uh, maybe it was a different different guy. Yeah, I think it was Neil Young. So anyway, we talk a lot about that, about, you know, you will serve someone or something. Yeah. Um, it may not be God. It may not be anti-God. may not be the devil. Mm. It might just be yourself, but you're going to end up serving something. Absolutely. A couple more things, and then I'm going to get into the history of this okay. and how we got there. The Christian view, God's view of uh, homosexuality as a matter of psychology, it is reversible. And I mentioned there are several thousand studies that have clearly shown that. In fact, one of the most recent studies that is, they no longer allow these type studies to be done or published in our field. But one of the most recent studies was done in 84, published in 84 by Masters and Johnson, who are considered the gold standard in the study of human sexuality. Mm -hmm. They did a five-year follow-up study of people they, tr they treated uh, for homosexuality to move to transgender, uh, to, from homosexuality to heterosexuality. And they reported, after five years, a 65% success rate. Mm. So this notion that when they talk about conversion therapy not being successful, I don't, I'm not even sure how they're defining conversion therapy, but the notion that people cannot change their sexual orientation is, is simply not true because there are a number, thousands of scientific studies that have been done and published that clearly show that is possible. Hmm. So the last thing is a matter of sociology. Homosexuality is not normal. It, it, I, you know, I don't know that it's a mental illness. I, I don't know that I agree with the early psychologists on that. Mm -hmm. But it, at the very least, it is a disruption in the normal developmental process. And uh, that doesn't lead to, uh, you know, uh, the attraction to people of the opposite sex. Uh, there's some disruption that has occurred in the individual. So I, I, I call that, uh, we, we spoke a little bit before, and I mentioned that, you know, you know, I did a lesson with our youth on on being gay, and I talk about that as not being part of the natural sequence of right. things. Right. So if it's not the part of natural sequence of things, then what does that make it? It, it, it is, uh, again, I mean, it, it's, ab it, I don't want to use necessarily abnormal, but it, it's not the normal process. It's unnatural. A, it's spirit. unnatural process. Yeah, that's probably right. more accurate. It doesn't fit with natural law. And the result of that also, because of that, is that uh, one of the things that's never talked about in our culture is the disease that goes with uh, homosexual activity, hmm. uh, the actual act itself. In fact, uh, hopefully we'll get to it at some point in here, uh, the, the individuals who ended up laying out the plan for how to change our culture, one of the things they made clear they did not want to talk about was the act itself. Hmm. Because to talk about the act itself 
And what comes from that, the diseases that come from that, uh, would not make it acceptable. So that's still behind closed doors. The, the gay community today doesn't talk about that. They don't want to really acknowledge it and bring it out because uh, they have to answer a, a lot of other issues. It brings up a lot of other things. So as far as the disease that you're talking about or diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, right. I'm assuming, you know, that HIV, different ones like that. Okay. That runs across the spectrum now between heterosexual and, and homosexual. Right. Um, but you, you had mentioned something about a percentage of... Yeah, recent studies over the last 10, 12 years have shown that uh, 70 to 80% of sexually transmitted diseases originate from uh, homosexual activity. Hmm. Uh, and that's in published scientific journals uh, uh, that, that show that it, is, it runs rampant there hmm. in that, that uh, community. And then if they end up having sex, you know, if they're bisexual, that ends up being transferred over. It's not to say that heterosexuals cannot get sexually transmitted disease. Absolutely they do. But in terms of sheer numbers and percentages, it's overwhelmingly uh, on the side of uh, heterosexual or homosexual activity. Okay. So you mentioned how, you know, ask how do we get here? What you really do, how we get here, we got to go back uh, to uh, some significant issues, or significant events that happened back in the 70s. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association, remember I mentioned that uh, DSM considered homosexuality a mental illness. Yes. Back in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association voted to remove it from uh, the DSM as a mental illness. Two years later, the American Psychological Associated vote, Association voted to do the same thing. Both did it without any new scientific evidence in support of this change. And I'm going to go back and talk about why that occurred. To start off, we really need to go back to 1969 in June. Uh, I think June 28th, 1969. Uh, on that night, uh, there were, uh, what happened was uh, riots took place, uh, first starting in a uh, gay bar called Stonewall Inn. Stonewall. Stonewall, Stonewall Inn. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Stonewall Inn. And what had happened, well, first of all, the, the New York City police, uh, Stonewall Inn, by the way, is in Greenwich Village in New mm -hmm. York City. Uh, the police had a history of raiding gay bars and transgender bars, and sometimes with cause, sometimes without cause, and, and it was really bad. Mm -hmm. That particular night, they had cause. They had a good reason for it. They were, had good evidence. They raided it, but the transgendered community that was in the bar that night, um, they had just kind of reached a tipping point, and they began to riot inside the, the bar and and it's you know spilled out onto the streets, and they had riots that just were up and down the street there. And um, that a year later from that, they ended up uh, having a march celebrating the, the Stonewall riots, and uh, and that really became the first gay pride parade. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason we, uh, oh, not we, but our culture celebrates. Uh, gay Pride Month in June is in recognition of what happened Stonewall, in Stonewall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that marks the first, or, or really the modern day movement, a gay and uh, lesbian movement for rights in our culture. Mm -hmm. and, and so and that's what they go back to. Along about that same time, um, activists for both uh, gay and lesbian activists, the leaders for the activists, uh, leaders for the transgendered uh, movement uh, from both East Coast and West Coast, as well as leaders for the uh, NAMBLA, which is the, I believe, North American Man Boy Association, which is for pedophiles. They all got together and began to meet and talk about how they could work together to change our culture, hmm. to get our culture to be more accepting of their lifestyle. And um, the uh, as they got into it and talking about it, one of the things they realized is that in order for them to be successful in changing our culture, they had to present themselves as victims and to get the straight community to begin to feel sorry for them so that they could step in there and begin to be the protectors of them. I mean, that, that literally was the plan. As they began to talk about this and look at this, they realized, well, I say they, it was the leaders of the gay and lesbian activists, 
they began to realize if they all three tried to get their civil rights together, they all tried to change this at once, they would fail. The reason being, it would be hard to portray transgendered individuals who are voluntarily taking hormones, mm -hmm. who are voluntarily mutilating their genitals to see them as victims, for the straight culture to see them as victims. They also realized that it would be hard for the straight community to accept pedophiles as victims when they're the ones victimizing children. Mm. And so what they did is they basically kicked them, uh, the transgendered community and the pedophile community, to the curb. And they said, we're going to go along, go, go this alone. And once we have our rights and once we have changed our culture's view about homosexuality, then we'll come back and begin to help you. Now, that pretty much culminated for the gay and lesbian community in 2015 when our culture gave its blessing on same-sex marriage by the, by the decision the Supreme Court made that summer. Mm -hmm. Along about that same time, we see the second wave hitting our shores in, in the form of the bathroom bills that were going across various state legislatures. We, we still see that second wave here today with, with uh, uh, males who have transgendered into female Competing in women's sports, mm -hmm. swimming, yeah, swimming. It's been we, in the news a lot. Ab absolutely, Leah, with that Penn State, is, Penn State swimmer. Yeah, Leah. And, I think Leah's his name. I'm not sure, yeah. but uh, and then we're also seeing it now being played out with, um, you know, bills like you know, like in Texas with the on the, the primary. You talked about prohibiting uh, giving minors uh, hom uh, hormones or, right. or Therapy, any, yeah. Uh, yeah. any type of surgery. Uh, but that's being encouraged across our culture right now, allowing for that to happen. So we're really in the second wave of, of this wave of, of this trying to ch change our culture. The third wave probably will begin to hit us in the next 10, 15 years, and that is the acceptance of pedophilia, the acceptance of adults having sex with children. Hmm. And so that's what we're facing coming down the road. So we're in the middle of this, this transformation of our culture that really started back there in the late 60s, early 70s. Hmm. Wow. So we're in the middle of yeah, this we're right in the middle. radical transformation, yeah. basically, of our culture. Yeah. And, um, you know, what has, what, what has history taught us about the in different empires, if you will, uh, right before that they collapsed? Yeah, I mean, uh, you see a lot of this type uh, of behavior, a lot of this type of attitude uh, in cultures who are on the decline. Mm. And right now, Western civilization is on the decline uh, with the acceptance of, of homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, focus on our senses, trying to indulge our senses. Uh, we see a move away from empiricism and rationalism that uh, that came on with the Enlightenment that really birthed uh, Western civilization. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a move away from that with, with critical theory, mm -hmm. uh, like, where there's just the most important thing is not what empirical evidence says or rational, uh, rationalism says, but what do I experience? What am I feeling? Right. In, in our own personal experiences. So it's really, let's follow our feelings. Yeah, follow Not our feelings. necessarily the science. Not follow the science. Well, let me go back to the science here. And, and okay. With the gay and lesbian movement, what they, the activists, what they did back in 1970, they ended up um, going in and disrupting uh, the American Psychological Association's conference in 1970, they held it in Hawaii. Now, American Psychological Association, they have a conference every year. Mm -hmm. There they present professional papers. They end up talking about the latest in research. One of the guys presenting was a guy by the, by the name of Dr. Irving uh, Bieber. He's an eminent psychoanalyst, an eminent researcher in this area, and his paper was on homosexuality and transgenderism. As he got up to present uh, his paper, there was a group of gay and lesbian activists in the crowd who began to heckle him and disrupt him, stand and yell and scream to the point that he could not present. Mm -hmm. As a way of trying to shut him up, they were able to get a meeting with the uh, chairman of the APA committee on the convention, who puts on the convention every year. And what they got the, uh, the uh, committee chairman to agree to is that the following year, in 1971, 
that they would be allowed to have their own session, a, 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 um, a group of people be able to share on homosexuality and present a differing viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And they agreed to do that in return that they would shut up and not disturb any other sessions. Well, they didn't carry through with that. They did disturb other sessions. In fact, what they ended up doing is they went into another larger meeting that was made up, you know, probably a thousand other uh, eminent professional, you know, psychiatrist, uh, eminent, um, important in their field. And in the middle of somebody talking, they marched up to the stage, grabbed the microphone out of the speaker's hands, and turned it over to an outside agitator who was not a psychiatrist, but was part of their movement. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the person ended up saying this, psychiatry is the enemy incarnate. Psychiatry has waged a relentless war of extermination against us. You may take this as a declaration of war against you. We're rejecting all of you as our owners. The amazing thing about that is no one tried to stop them and no one objected to what they did. What happened after that is they ended up, because they continued to disrupt, they, uh, they were able to secure a meeting with the APA's Committee on Nomenclature. Now, my opinion is that the APA Committee on Nomenclature is the most important committee in all of mental health, psychiatry, psychology, social work, any of them. And here's why. This is the committee that is responsible for, I've mentioned before, the DSM, mm -hmm. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Mm -hmm. Nobody can do anything without that manual in the United States and Canada. Those are the two countries that use it. Right. Okay. And maintain their license. And maintain their license. Right. Yeah, well, and get paid. You can't get <laughs> okay. it. has all the codes in there. You've got to <laughs> right. use that. That's right. And so they secured a meeting with them, and, and they met, the chairman met with them. And in that meeting, he allowed perhaps the possibility that, you know, there was a new way of thinking about homosexuality and that maybe the DSM needed to reflect that and, and that change. Now, part of the reason for them allowing the APA on Committee on Nomenclature to allow them to meet, and I don't have time to go into the detail, but psychiatry in the late 60s, early 70s was undergoing a relentless assault on a number of fronts, mm -hmm. basically stating it's a fraud. Okay, psychiatry is a fraud. And, uh, and you know, there was a book that came out, The Myth of Mental, Mental Illness, uh, and uh, by Thomas Zaz, and, and so... They didn't want another attack on them, and so they kind of caved into the gay and lesbian activists. And so, what in order to make that change, they scheduled a meeting for a committee meeting for '73, so in 1973, so people could come in and present their viewpoints. Those who objected to this change of removing homosexuality from the DSM, they were only given 15 minutes to go over 70 years previous of research published in published professional journals that said it wasn't a mental illness and that it was a treatable mental illness. Mm -hmm. The committee voted to remove it. Because an objection was raised in the meeting, they had, that met, according to their bylaws, it had to go to the entire membership of the American Psych Psychiatric Association, which at that time numbered around 30,000. APA active, uh, the gay and lesbian activists left that meeting did a letter writing campaign, sent it out to all 30,000. Only about a third of the people responded and voted for its removal. And so that's why homosexuality was removed from the diagnostic manual. Not because of any new science, not because of any new findings. It was totally a political move to try to save psychiatry. That was it. Mm. Uh, four years later, the medical, uh, the journal, Medical Aspects of Human Sexuality did a survey among all psychiatrists. 69% of all psychiatrists, four years after this change, said, no, mental, uh, homosexuality is still a mental illness. They disagreed with the change that it had been made there. Now, here's where it starts to get a little scary, because uh, it affects you as a minister. In 1994, the Board of Trustees of the American Psychiatric Association voted to, well, they considered altering the code of ethics for psychiatry. What was proposed by gay and lesbian activists at that time is that if somebody treats, if a professional psychiatrist treats someone who has, who's homosexual and to treat them to, for them to become heterosexual, even at the patient's request, even if they came in and said, I'm gay, I really don't like living this lifestyle, 
helped me to be homosexual, heterosexual. They would make it an ethical violation to where they could not only lose their license, but they could be sued by the person. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there were objectors to this. Uh, a fight ensued, and the fight was with therapists who did treat gay and lesbian individuals and a large number of ex-homosexuals. They threatened a lawsuit that would reopen the decision-making process to possibly put it back into the DSM. When they threatened that, the APA committee backed off mm. and, and didn't force that change in the ethics. Mm. When they were interviewed afterwards as to what was the end game, they said, well, if we'd have been successful in making an ethical violation for psychiatrists, our next group we were going after were psychologists, then social workers, then pastoral counselors and ministers. Now, what that would mean is this. Paul, if somebody came in here in our church and gave their heart to the Lord and they said, man, I, I've been gay and, and I see where the word of God says homosexuality is a sin. I don't want to sin against my God. I don't want to do something that's unnatural. Will you counsel with me? Will you help me? And you say, yeah, I'll, we'll go through the Bible. I'll do biblical counseling. That would put you then in a position that they could come back and sue you and the church and take away your license. And once you have make something a civil suit, it's not that far removed from making it a criminal suit, mm -hmm. which they've done in some areas. They've mm -hmm. done in Canada and some areas in some states. The, there's criminal offenses for working with gays to try to help yeah, the, that transition. The so-called conversion, conversion therapy, therapy has yes. been outlawed. In some so that's what they were going for. The, our culture seeks to give the impression that this notion that people are born that way is settled science. It is not. They tend to try to give the impression that a person cannot change their sexual orientation. That is not true. There are, like I said, there are thousands of published research journal articles that clearly show this is possible. Wow. Wow. I mean, wow. So where does it end? I mean, once this door has been opened, once Pandora's box is, has been unleashed and, you know, they're starting to make it, uh, you know, civilly liable. If you counsel people that mm -hmm. seek counseling, mm -hmm. where does it stop? I mean, what if, someone comes in and says that they're engaged in, you know, they, they're they engaged in a physical relationship with their cat. Mm -hmm. Where does it end? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have people lining up, getting ready to make that? Well, uh, one of the major revelations... The new normal. <laughs> one of the major revelations with Hugh Hefner, it was one of his former girlfriends who said that she walked in on him one day having sex with his dog. And uh, so um, that's already happening in our culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> some guy in California a few years back married a tree. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's moving towards there are no boundaries. Mm -hmm. I don't want any boundaries. I mean, it, it really is going back to the garden when Adam and Eve uh, ate of the apple. I mean, mm -hmm. he stood there and, and Satan said, you know, this one boundary that God's given you, he didn't really mean it. You know, yeah, he, did ahead. he really say that? Yeah, yeah, did he really say that? You know, I think he, you know, he's trying to sure. keep it for himself. Yeah. You know, so go ahead and eat it. And and so it, it's this is the same thing that's been happening since the beginning of time, since man walked the earth of, hmm. of ignoring God's boundaries that He puts in place to uh, protect us for our best benefit. I mean, He created us; He knows how we best function. And if we function according to what his word says, that's when we live the healthiest, that's when we're the happiness, that's when we have the best mental health, the richest relationships, is when we follow what God says. So what would you say out there as a, as a uh, behavioral professional to someone that may be struggling with this issue? Maybe they're struggling with uh, same-sex attraction or, or uh, in the gay lifestyle or with a gay community and and they don't know really i mean it's got to be a conflict right mm -hmm. i mean it's got to be a conflict mm -hmm. and so what kind of advice would you would you give them well first of all it's it's not an easy journey 
Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be real honest. It's not a matter of just stop doing it. Uh, you know, that that's that's ridiculous. I mean, we all have trouble stopping things. I mean, I have trouble stopping the chocolate pie, okay? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, that's mild compared to what we're talking about, but we all have areas where we have trouble mm -hmm. with, with choice. And what, what is absolutely critical is to get into what God's Word says mm -hmm. and to read His Word. The only way any of us, I don't care what the, what the issue is, what the behavior is, the only way any of us change is through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go through and read through the book of Romans, and it talks over there in chapter uh, 8, in, in 7 and 8, latter part of 7 and 8. It talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in us to change us, to transform us. Uh, it also is essential to have a, a, a loving community uh, of, of men and women who will walk alongside us mm -hmm. uh, whenever we're struggling with those, those type of issues. And regardless, whether we're dealing with homosexuality, we're dealing with anger, we're dealing with uh, you know, alcoholism or substance abuse. We pornography. Need other, or, pornography. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. And, and, and as Christians, we need to get away from just focusing on homosexuality as, as being the major sin. Well, there are a lot of major sins. There are a lot of things. All of sin, sin is sin. Yeah. And, and we need to be loving towards other people and patient. And, I, and our, I, I wish I could think of the name of the book or out of hand I can't, but it's a story of a, a woman who was in a, a, a professor at Syracuse who was in a, a lesbian relationship a long time, many years, and uh, set out to uh, really write a paper on disputing what God's Word says. And she realized, well, to dispute it, I've got to read it. And secondly, I need to talk to somebody who uh, believes it. And so she met a, a, I believe he was a Presbyterian minister. Mm -hmm. He bef befriended her. And, and he and his wife began to just love on her. Didn't go in there and preach. Mm -hmm. Just loved, answered questions, and loved on her. And she began going to their church with her partner, and they just began loving on her. And they really didn't have to say a lot. They just loved and demonstrated God's word and God's truth of who God was. And over about a year or so, she realized, I can't continue walking down this road. I mean, I, I, you know, I've given my heart to the Lord. I can't continue to go down this road given what God's word has said. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in someone's life. It's we good. in the church don't need to be ramming it down their throat. We need to be it's loving good. people and be yeah. patient with them because I need people to be patient with me. Well, yeah, it's that same grace that has been extended to us, that mm -hmm. same forgiveness that has been extended to us for our, all of our faults. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, that's great advice. And so, yeah, if you're out there and you're struggling, um, contact us. And, you know, everybody is welcome at Capstone Church. Yes. Just as you are. You don't have to yeah. get cleaned up. You don't have to, to be perfect because nobody's perfect. And, and if you think you're perfect, as soon as you walk in a church, you just made that church imperfect. Absolutely. So, um, well, it sure is great to have you on, on well, thank Fringes you for of having me. Faith. And what a, what a powerful and enlightening topic. I mean, they're never even realized how deep that, that this cultural transformation and this shift actually goes and how far back it began. And we're still only... We're still in the middle of it. In the middle of it. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Well, thank you again. And for everyone out there that, that's listening, be sure to tune in uh, next week. We'll have our next podcast episode. Um, and, in, you know, that's it for today. Yes. Man, I'm just, I'm still speechless uh, all right so we love you we're praying for you and remember to stay in the word stay alert and be not deceived bye-bye god bless you